Right, if everybody can hear me okay, uh, thanks for coming along and um, I'll get start with tonight's talk. This is actually based on a talk that I did <coughs> a few weeks ago, <coughs> well, maybe about a month or so ago, but I've tweaked it considerably. So if you saw the, the talk then, it's a wee bit different now. Um, the, this, is, this is one in a series of talks that I've been doing. There are another couple coming up to finish this little festival of talks and stuff. I'll be doing one on the Loch Bar Ring Dyke next Monday. And the Monday after that, I'm going to be talking about dikes, sills, cone sheets, plugs, and all these goodies to do with igneous geology and with particular reference to mull. And then that will that'll finish the thing off. So we'll get started with tonight's talk. It's about lava flows of mull and staffa. And that's me uh, talking about it. And um, well, we'll show you what we've got. The topics I want to cover, I want to have a quick look at Mull's geology. That probably sounds like an oxymoron, a quick look at Mull's geology, but anyway, um, we'll have a quick look at Mull's paleogene or tertiary as it used to be known, igneous activity. The lava sequence itself, of course we're looking at lavas tonight mainly. The age of the lavas, there's things called the plateau lavas which make up most of Mull. And there's also the Staffa lava formation, which is the main thing I want to look at tonight. For sources of information, there are certain things that are absolutely essential. Um, if I start down sort of date order, down the bottom right, left here, I've got the, the memoir, the Mull memoir that was done, a beautiful piece of work done by Edward Bailey and his troops way back in the 1920s. Uh, it's a superb document, very technical, very detailed, um, but I mean, it's, it still stands the test of time. The Mull memoir is essential reading for anyone that's interested in the geology of Mull and Iona. Um, there is also things like more recent publications, such as the SNH guide called A Landscape Fashioned by Geology. Now, this isn't available as a printed book anymore, unless you can get it secondhand on Amazon or Abe or some secondhand bookshop, but you can actually download it as a PDF file. The complete book is downloadable as a PDF from the SNH website. There's also an updated version of it called The Landscapes in Stone by Alan McCurdy and the Mull, Iona and Arden American one basically covers what the Mull and Iona one did before. There's a book that goes back to the 1960s called The Tertiary Ignis Geology of Isle of Mull. This is an excursion guide and as it stands, this is still the main excursion guide to the Isle of Mull. There hasn't really been a, a better one produced since then. Um, it goes into quite a bit of detail about various aspects of the geology. But um, yeah, well worth it's, it's very commonly referred to. It's cited in an awful lot of papers. Uh, it's quite an influential document, this when it was first produced. Um, we've also got the maps, Ross of Mull, uh, Staffa, and Eastern Mull. These are the main Mull geology maps. Um, essential reading if you're interested in geology. The book Mull in the Making, down the right hand side here, is was written by Ros Jones and it's still for sale. It's still been published. It's a great little guide to Mull. Um, it's particularly good on things like stratigraphy and how things have changed through time. It's very good on that. Um, the other book which is pretty well essential if you're keenly interested in geology is this one. It's called The Paleogene Volcanic Districts by uh, Henry Emilius and Brian Bell. Now this is this is excellent. This is just fantastic, this book. Can't praise this one enough. It doesn't just cover mull, it covers egg, sky, rum, Aaron, Arden American, the lot. Um, really, really good book and uh, well worth getting a hold of. The, the diagrams, the pictures, the graphics in it are just second to none. They really are good. Right. Some of the papers that are related to what I'm uh, talking about tonight, this is a lot more technical, this stuff here. This is this is all really quite technical. Um, but if you're if you're keenly interested, this this will these are really essential reading. Um, you'll be able to get these later. I'm not going to read this out. I mean, these are just these are just some of the the main really good papers that have been produced on these lava flows and things. Um, in particular, this bottom one by Ian Williamson and Brian Bell, the Staffa Lava Formation. I'll be referring to that a lot tonight. 
it's an absolutely amazing piece of work. It's seriously detailed, uh, seriously technical in parts, but it's, a, it's one of the most thorough pieces of writing I've ever seen on a particular subject. It's very, very good. So we'll have a quick look at Mole's geology. It looks very complex, but you can actually break it down into easier chunks. And this talk tonight is going to be on the easier stuff, okay? Not the, not the really complicated stuff, the easier stuff. If you want to know about the really complicated stuff, I'll be talking about that next week when I'm doing the Loch Bar Ring Dyke. So you've been warned. Look at maps first. Here's Mull in context. <clears throat> this is a BGS map that I nicked from somewhere on the BGS website. Um, you've got the Great Glen Fault running here, which actually runs through southeast Mull. There's Mull here, Sky, Western Isles, Island, you know, Scottish mainland. Um, there's, it just shows you it's sort of, Mull is sort of in the middle and sort of uh, on the west. Uh, I think most people probably know where it is, but it's, it's closely related to various other centres on the west coast, which you can see in this map. Now, this is from the, a, what do you call it? The, I showed you the Paleogene Volcanic Districts. This is, this is actually fr from uh, an earlier version of it. Uh, St Kilda, Sky, Rum, Ardnamurkin, Mull, Arran, uh, Antrim, Morn Mountains, and Lundy Island as well, in fact. These are all centres of igneous activity. These are places that were volcanic 60 million years ago. There was a lot of activity going on. And, um, you know, they're all very, very interesting, these areas. Uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the study of the geology of any one of these, but the, the work of a lifetime. But um, they're all basically in a line up the west coast. And the volcanic activity that is concentrated in these areas, like I said, is about 60, goes back about 60 million years. And it relates to the opening up of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, the Atlantic Ocean is still opening up. You know, it's still measurable, a few centimetres a year. And, you know, the famous split that runs through Iceland. Uh, but um, way back in, you know, sort of Cretaceous times, it was starting to open up. And uh, the igneous activity that was down the West Coast at that time is related to that, uh, that fracturing and that opening up. So the West Coast would have been a pretty interesting place to have been at that time, 60 million years ago. Um, people have asked for comparisons with today. I would say the best comparison is probably Iceland. In fact, a lot of the rocks that we'll be looking at tonight are also very similar to a lot of the stuff you'll get in Iceland. Very, very similar. So Iceland is probably the nearest equivalent. So if you want to know what Mull was like 60 million years ago, have a look at Iceland today. And this is a wee bit more detail. Again, it's from Emilius and Bell, the Paleogene Volcanic Districts. And this shows some of this stuff in a bit more detail. These green blobs are what they call the central complexes. That's where all the complicated stuff's going on. And the lighter colored stuff is the lava fields. Uh, these nice cover uh, quite extensive areas. So there was quite a lot of outpouring of lava uh, at that time. I'll be using this map quite a bit. Um, this is from the SNH booklet, Landscape Fashioned by Geology. And it gives a simplified geological map of Mull. Um, the green stuff that you see here and over in Morvern as well, all this green stuff sort of around the edges in the west, and in the north, Alva, Staffa, Treshnish Isles, that's all lava fields. That's great outpourings of lava, basaltic lava. Um, on the main BGS map, they show it as pink. Uh, so the stuff you see in pink is the stuff you see in green here. This messy looking thing in the middle is what they call the central complex, which is uh, a lot more complicated, but we won't be dealing with that. We'll be avoiding that. One of the things you'll notice if you look at this map carefully is you'll see there's sort of yellowish stuff and brownish stuff around the edges. And that is the underlying rocks that the lava was poured out on top of. So you've got the yellow stuff, which is rocks of Mesozoic age, which means Triassic, Cretaceous, Ju Jurassic, Cretaceous. Think of the dinosaurs. That's the era we're talking about there. This brown stuff, and there's also some here, and it's in a few other places as well, are much older metamorphic rocks that underlie most of Mull. And there's a big chunk of it over in Morvern here as well. So that's, that's what these are. So the, this green stuff, all this lava is basically sitting on top of these much older rocks. And this red thing down the bottom here is the Ross of Mull granite. 
uh, this red thing here is a Strontian granite complex. Now they're both about the same age, about 420 million years old. Um, we won't be looking at them tonight, that's a separate thing. So that's the, that's the overall geology. Like I said, this bit in the middle is quite complicated, but the stuff around the edges uh, the, the, the forms the majority and is actually fairly straightforward. Those black lines that you see running across here are what are called dikes. And I'll be talking about dikes later, basically splits in earth crust filled with molten material. And um, uh, there's, there's a lot of them in Mull. Mull is absolutely full of dikes, but we'll, we'll deal with them later. <coughs> Here's the BGS map again. That's you know quite a bit different. I've often joked it looks like an explosion in a paint factory. This bit in the middle, it's fiendishly complicated. And of course, the thing is, you know, you've got all these nice colors, but you go out into the field, the rocks, and apart from the fact you can hardly see anything because it's all grass and trees and bracken and scree and all sorts of horrible stuff like that. When you do find the rock, it's usually grey or brown or greyish brown or dirty mud grey or whatever. You know, it doesn't look like this at all. So just a, a word of warning if you do go out looking for it. If we move on, this is the what's called the Staffa BGS map. And this uh, obviously contains the island of Staffa here. That's Staffa, that's Ulva. These are the Treshnish Isles here, and this is northwest and western Mull. Um, Staffa is where the, the Staffa lava formation has its type locality, which we'll be looking at closely. Um, you also get the same stuff in Ulva as well. Uh, it's one of these maps where there seems to be an awful lot of sea for, you know, you don't get much m land for your money. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's called, it's called, it's called Staffa, this particular map, if you're looking for it. The equivalent map to the south is called the Ross of Mull. <coughs> there's Iona, this is the Ross of Mull granite here. And there's all this pink basaltic igneous rock here as well. This is the stuff we'll be looking at. And we'll be looking at quite a few locations that are actually on this bit of the map here. We'll see them later. The famous fossil tree is at this point here, and the, the art ton leaf beds are down here, and Carsig arches is over this way. So there's some good stuff on here on this map. <coughs> there's also a North Mull geological map, which is actually includes the Ardamurkin complex. And there's Ardamurkin, you can see all these ring-shaped structures. Um, that would make a good subject for a talk at some point in the future as well, but uh, yeah, Mull itself and this big chunk of Morvern, as you can see, it's nearly all pink, it's nearly all lava flows. And again, you've got all these dikes, all these northwest, southeast lines running across it. <coughs> so these are the main geological maps that you need for looking at the geology of Mull. So Mull's Paleogene, or previously known as tertiary igneous activity, is extremely complex, as you can see just by looking at the map. It covers a fairly limited geological period. It's only about 3 million years, it's less than that. And uh, so it was quite, a, you know, in geological time, that's just a blink of an eye. That's just a short, violent episode. You know, that's not a protracted period of activity. That's, that's really quite short. Um, the first thing, the first thing that you see in the igneous sequence is what's called a basal mudstone. It's called the Ben Eatin mudstone after the location in Morvern where it was first described. And what this is, is a volcanic ash that was deposited as the very, very first thing at the start of the igneous period. Very often when volcanic activity begins, you get ash coming out rather than lava. And if you think about, you know, recent volcanic activity, this is quite a common feature. Um, and the Beniatin mudstone is basically a volcanic ash that has been altered and weathered and reworked, and generally mucked about. And it forms a, a fairly extensive distinct layer at the very, very base of the, the tertiary lavas, it's the very, very first thing that happened. Um, after that, you have the first phase of eruption of lavas, with quite a bit of lava on top of the, the, the mudstone. You've got dikes all the way through this period, all the way through the uh, Mall igneous episode, there was, there was dikes cutting up and uh, cutting through the rocks. The, later on, you had the intrusion of what's called the central complex. That was that complicated looking bit I showed you on the map earlier, the, the brightly colored bit in the middle. It, um, it happened later on. Uh, the lavas were first, and then the central complex it was intruded into the lavas. So if we look at the next sl slide. This is from Emilius and Bell's uh, Paleogene Volcanic Districts, and it shows you the, the various age relationships of the different things. The pink stuff here, that's Mallard and Merkin Sky and Adam Niels Craig. The pink stuff represents lavas, and that's the period of time, millions of years. 
over which the lavas were erupted and the greenish bluish stuff on top that's the central complexes that's the complicated stuff I was talking about the black line represents the period over which dikes were intruded and as you can see for all these centers there was dikes taking place all the way through the whole thing that are, that are a feature of the landscape just in all these places uh, right the way through the whole igneous episode <coughs> The white and the black represent the magnetic uh, reversals. White is the normal magnetic field and black is reversed. Now, I know these don't tie up. This was pointed out once before in the previous talk I did on this. I'm not sure why they don't tie up because they should be the same for all of them. Maybe that's a question for, uh, I need to ask Brian Bell, who was my supervisor. So um, I need to ask him sometime why these don't quite add up. But um, that's what that represents. I wouldn't worry too much about that. There's a lot of question marks as well, as you can see. So I think there's quite a bit of doubt about some of this. But certainly the, the lavas, the pink stuff was first, and then the central complex and the dikes all the way through. Move on a bit. Oh, just a quick word about the dikes. They continued through the whole period. They tend to run, if you look at the map, in a northwest southeast direction. And they extend onto the mainland. They go for quite a distance across the mainland as well. Now, one of the things that you'll read about uh, all over the place in different books and papers and websites and things is that where the lava flow is fed by dikes now you can see things like this taking place in places like Iceland today you get what's called fissure fed eruptions which is a great big split in the ground the magma comes up and it pours out its lava at the surface so there's a, there's this theory that the the lava flows actually are actually fed from dikes but just to be awkward there are very 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 few places such as in a cliff or whatever, where you can actually see a dike coming up and then spreading out as a lava flow. There are very, very few places you get anything even remotely like that. So the dikes may not have fed the lava. The lava flows may have been fed from central uh, conduits rather than the dikes. So the, you know, the, the jury's very much out in this one. The dikes are also concentrated in certain areas. Crogan in particular and Loch Nakiel, you'll find dike after dike after dike. And there are so many of them being injected into the, the crust at, that, at these points that they reckon it's about 12 to 13% dilation of the crust caused by this. So there's a, that's a serious amount of material getting uh, pushed up and into it and the, the crust being stretched because of it. So you know, the, I'll be talking about dikes again, as I said, in the, the, the final talk I'm doing in two weeks time. So if, if anyone's got any questions, you can come back then, we'll get some good stuff for you. So the lava sequence itself, these are the main components. At the bottom, you've got this ash, which is now the mudstone. It's quite thin. It's not, it's not a big extensive thing. It's extensive, but it's not uh, really thick. Then you've got the earliest lavas, and these are the ones I want to look at tonight in particular, what's called the Staffa lava formation. That's the stuff that's nice and columnar and stuff you get in Staffa itself. It looks really interesting and exciting. On top of the Staffa lava formation, you've then got what they call plateau lavas. And these are the ones that form the big, thin, uh, terraced landscapes that are so common in Mull. They reach their thickest uh, extent on Ben Moore. On the very top of Ben Moore, there's a thing called the Ben Moore Pale Member, uh, which is a type of uh, a lava sequence, which is where you get the famous Ben Moorite from. There's a type of rock called Ben Moorite, uh, which is found up there. It's quite light colored. That's why they call it the Ben Moore Pale Member. I'm not going to do very much on that at all, except just mention it in the passing. But uh, that, that's where it was originally named from, with Ben Moore. And there's also what's called the Mull Central Lava Formation, because the central complex had a volcano on top of it, and that poured out a certain amount of lavas, and uh, they're probably the, the last of the lava formations. So that's the, that's the main lava sequence. There's basically five bits to it, if you like. But we're going to concentrate on the, the earliest stuff, the, Staffa lava formation. <clears throat> this is what the plateau lavas typically look like. This is taken from, uh, I think, near our ton, looking over to Armeonach. Uh, again, this is from Emilius and Bell's book. Beautiful terracing in the lavas. The thing about these plateau lavas is they tend to form long, spread out, quite thin flows. The thing about basalts is they're quite runny. It's, quite, it's not viscous, it's thin and it runs. It goes for quite a distance. It's quite fluid. So what happens is it tends to build up these thin, repeated flows. And that's what you've got at this point. That's, that's, that's our Armeonach there, looking over to Berg. Um, 
and it's it's very very typical sort of scenery. It's what um, it's what's known as trap topography, after a Swedish word meaning a step, and you can see why it's just like terraces. Another thing that you'll find in these plateau lavas, and this is quite com common, especially in north and west Mall, are what they call these red horizons. Now these are bright red, and they represent the top of a lava flow that's been weathered. It's been subjected to subaerial weathering in a dry, warm climate, and it's broken down. And the reddish colour is because of all the iron-rich minerals that are in the rock. It's basically a fossil soil that you're looking at there. Sometimes called red bowls. Uh, and these are really common in Mull. You'll see them everywhere. Uh, they're very, very distinctive. Some of them are almost orange in colour, not just red. Uh, if, you, if you're going to Tobermory from Salon, you can see them in the road cuttings really, really clearly. Uh, so that's, that's a very common feature of the, the lavas. Another thing that's common are these things. Now, I know that I've got no scale indicator, which is a, not good news, but these are about probably about a centimetre. The biggest one's probably a centimetre across. These are called amygdales. And what these are, are gas bubbles in the rock, which get filled, that the rock solidifies with these bubbles in it. And then at a later date, you've got these high pressure, high temperature liquids and fluids percolating through the rocks and depositing these crystals. So most of the amygdales that you find in Mull are quite small. I mean, geologists dream of going and finding a big massive cavity filled with crystals, but uh, there's nothing major like that that you find. They tend to be quite small, but these white specks, you'll find them in the rocks all over the place. It's very distinctive and they're, they're called amygdales. If the, if the gas bubbles are empty and there's no crystals in them, they get called vesicles. So these are it's a very common feature caused by a gas in the rock as it gets emplaced. I was talking about the Benmore Pale group, the, the Benmore, it's right at the top of Benmore, that's Benmore seen from the Alva Slipway uh, and the, the, the pale, the Benmoreite rock is at the very, very top. This is a beautiful illustration from the SNH booklet of what the central volcano would have looked like. Now, all that complicated stuff that I showed you on the earlier map is actually happening in here. And what we are seeing today is the eroded down stump of this volcano. We're not actually seeing the volcano itself. You're seeing the, what's basically at the bottom of it. And uh, that's, that's, that's a nice block diagram of what, probably what it would have looked like. So that's, that's the central volcano. Uh, quite, quite a nice diagram that. So we'll go back to the map. <coughs> The, um, this, like I said, this is the from the SNH booklet. It shows the overall geology of Mall and Diona. Um, we're going to be looking at the, well, like I said, the Staffa Lava Formation, which is mainly in the west and the southwest. So, Staffa Lava Formation. As I said, it's the lowest part of the lava sequence. It's, it's amongst the first stuff to get erupted. Above the Sta Staffa Lava Formation, you've got the pla what's called the Plateau Lavas. So what we'll look at is where to find it, where the locations are, what it looks like. We know that it's columnar, why and how. I want to look at what's called the paleo environment. In other words, what did the landscape look like that this stuff was erupted onto? What, when this, these, this volcanic activity was taking place, what did the surrounding land, what, what, did, it, what did it appear like? Uh, we'll look at other places with similar rocks and um, a quick wee summary and some photos to finish off with. So the Staffa Lava Formation, where to find it? I've got a map here that shows the main locations. And this is my own map that I put together. And it's Alva, Alva Ferry area, Staffa, a fossil tree area, Artun, Karsig, Karsig West, Karsig East, and also near Bloody Bay and Tobermory, there's some of this stuff. So we'll, we'll go around all these locations looking at it. It's actually geographically restricted. There are places where you don't get it. Now I said at the bit, you know, it's, it's the lowest of the lava flows, but if you go to places like near Greeburn and certainly a lot of North Mull and over in Morvern, there's no sign of this stuff. And there's a good reason for that that I'll explain later. But uh, it's, it's, it tends to be restricted to the south and west of Mull because that's where the landscape was uh, most uh, suitable for this stuff building up. There's the map again. As I said, we'll be 
looking at places like Carseg down here, um, will be over on the on the west. The um, there's Alva. Looking at that, Staffa, and around this way, the fossil tree area, um, Artun, and this area west of Carseg. So these are the the main areas where you find it. <clears throat> so what does it look like? What does a Staffa lava formation look like? How could you tell you're looking at Staffa lava formation? First thing is that the most distinctive thing is that a lot of it has got this distinct columnar appearance. It's got this almost, it's like pillars. It's, you know, it's in places it's absolutely spectacular. You know, places like Staff in particular. One of the things I've often said about Staff is, you know, I've been out there loads of times, but every time I go, it never loses the wow factor. You still find yourself thinking, wow, this is great. You know, the word awesome is probably one of the most overused cliches around these days, but for Staffa, it's absolutely perfect. The columns can be all sorts of angles. They're not necessarily vertical. They're, um, they, they, can, they can take on some bizarre, sort of grotesque shapes. Uh, there are also sedimentary rocks in between the lava flows. That's uh, one of the features of the Staffa lava formation is the presence of these sedimentary rocks. And um, these represent periods when there wasn't probably much volcanic activity going on and the, the rock would weather down, it would get eroded, you'd get plants colonizing it and stuff happening. So there was periods of what are called quiescence between lava flows. That paper that uh, Ian Williamson and Brian Bell did, that 2012 paper on the staff of lava formation describes this beautifully. There's some excellent stuff in there and I definitely recommend it to anyone who's really interested in this. I was talking about columns. Here's some columns for you. Staffa. And what you've got is you've got the main columnar lava flow here. It sits on a bed of ash, this stuff underneath. And on top, you've got this stuff, which is also columnar, but it looks crazy. It's all twisted and contorted. The vertical stuff is referred to as the colonnade and the twisted stuff on the top is called entablature. These are the terms that they use for it. And there are, there are reasons for that, which I'll explain in a wee while. That's Fingal's cave there. And that's, uh, so, which one is that? Can what cave that is that? McKinnon's cave, no, whatever. Anyway, that's, uh, that's Staffa. This is the clamshell cave in Staffa. And if you look at the curving and the columns there. See if it's called the clamshell cave. Cracking uh, uh, place. It's actually quite difficult to photograph because of its orientation. You'd have to be really, really early in the morning or very, very late in the afternoon in the summer to get the sun shining just right on it. But uh, it's really spectacular. And it's just above the landing uh, place. Here is the more little stumpy columns for you. This is the little island just off the coast of Staffa on the east side, Gordon Burchile, the herdsman. And it's, it's, it's really spectacular. I mean, it's just a little bit off the side of uh, Staffa, separate by a deep channel. But it never ceases to amaze me what it looks like. And you get a great view of it from the causeway where you, where you can walk around to Fingal's Cave, you look straight out onto this. So the, I mentioned sedimentary rocks between the flows. It, it, they represent quiet spells between extrusive episodes. And they're quite long periods as well. There are plant fragments, there are trees, there's all sorts of stuff in there. Um, some pictures. Now this is from Williamson, Williamson and Bell's book. This stuff on the top is lava. This is uh, basaltic lava that's come out. But all this stuff underneath is various sedimentary rocks. There's conglomerates, there's sandstones, there's, there's coal-like material. There's all sorts of good stuff under here. Um, you know, you think, of, you think of places like, you know, you look at the geological map of Ulva, and it's entirely pink almost, nearly entirely. It looks like it's just totally lava and nothing else. But then when you start looking at it in detail, when you start getting in close, you find these interesting sedimentary rocks in between the lava flows. So there's, there's, a, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of that all the way along there. Here's a, a famous outcrop called the Pulpit Rock. Now this is near Karsig Arches. And um, again, this is from uh, Williamson and Bell's paper. This is mainly conglomerate that's up here. This is lava underneath and it's quite a thickness of it. So, you know, there must have been a cases of a lava flow being established like this thing here and then material coming down probably in some alluvial type fan type environment 
where there's a, uh, you know, a lot of stuff getting washed down on top of it before the next layer uh, was deposited on the top. So you're, you know, they've got conglomerate sandstones and there's, oh, there's all sorts of stuff in here. Uh, the, the description here goes in quite a bit of detail about it. And here's one of my own things, this is my own picture of this. This black stuff is like coal, incredibly low quality coal between lava flows. And this was east of Karsig. Um, there's also a place called Kanyesa, which is to the west. And there's this black band of coal here between, and shale between the lavas. I, I seem to remember reading somewhere, I don't, I don't know if it's true, I don't be able to find the reference anymore, but that the monks from Iona used to dig this stuff and use it for heating. I don't think it'd be very good quality, to be honest, but it's a, it's a seam of coal in between the lava flows. Um, this, is, this is near the, the famous Gori's Leap, uh, on the, uh, near, not, not far from like Benesson. So, so there's all these interesting things in, in between the, la uh, the layers of the lava, and it's a, it's a very distinctive feature of the Staffa lava formation, these interbedded sedimentary layers. And as I said, it represents periods of quiet when there would, I mean, the fact that it's cold means there must have been plants and trees and all sorts of stuff like that growing on top of the lava flow um, to be able to form this. So it's columnar. Why columnar? What causes the columns to form? And what's the orientation of them? What, what determines that? And what about the paleo environment? What sort of a landscape was this lot er erupted out onto? Well, one, one of the things about the, you know, the eruption of this type of lava, and in fact, most of the mull lavas, most of the basalts, is that it wouldn't have been particularly violent. When you think of volcanic eruptions, you know, you think of things like uh, Mount St. Helens, which was devastating when it erupted. You think of things like, you know, like Vesuvius or more recently, things like M Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, which looks like a nuclear explosion when you see pictures of it. I think it was 1991 it erupted. The stuff that would have been happening in Mull at this time wasn't like that. It's more like the sort of thing you see in Hawaii. If you look at, ever see video of Hawaii, you'll see that the, there's plenty of lava pouring out the ground, but it tends to be a relatively gentle affair. It forms rivers that sort of run into the sea and stuff like this. Um, that's what would have been happening in Mull. The eruptions are what they call effusive rather than explosive. So it would have been fairly gentle. So you've had all this stuff pouring out the ground and sort of spreading out over the ground. The thing about the columns is they form at right angles to the cooling surface. So if you had lava pouring out onto a flat surface, um, then it could form columns that would be vertical. The thing that is required though, the important thing that is required for the columns to form is the presence of water. This has been shown to be a critical factor. There needs to be water to cause the initial cooling and the formation of the cracks that extend upwards to form the columns. Uh, that's, 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 that's one of the important things that's needed for this. The other thing is the what they call the paleo landscape, the relief of the landscape is important. A lot of these lavas would have ponded in valleys, the, like the Staffa flow. Now I mentioned earlier that when you get um, these basaltic lavas pouring out the ground, they tend to form thin flows. They tend not to be maybe a, you know, five to 10 meters thick. A lot of them, they're not particularly thick. But if you look at Staffa, that's a great big thickness of lava that you're seeing there. So you think, well, why did that happen? Well, the reason it happened is because it must have poured out into a valley in which it was ponded and it built up in that valley. And that's why you've got these uh, these columns like that, that great thickness of lava. It didn't have anywhere to go. So that's that's what um, that's what's happened there. And um, as I mentioned, Williamson and Bell have great information on this with really good graphics on the type of environment that would have been around at the time. So the, the important thing is the the, the, co the columns form at right angles to the cooling surface, but they have to have that water to trigger the formation of the columns. This is the sort of diagram that uh, Williamson Bell have in that, uh, that paper, and it shows you a valley with lava pouring into it and uh, building up. There's, um, it mentions water, and I mean, it's, it's all quite complicated, there's a lot of stuff in here, but um, that's, the, that's the sort of cartoons I've got in their paper, there's loads of these showing how it would have built up a successive layers. But the, 
The fact that it was flowing into valleys is important. These paleo valleys are uh, an important feature because that allows these thicknesses of lava to build up and, um, and for the columns to form. That's, that's, far, that's one of the reasons I mentioned earlier, there are places where you don't get the, uh, the staff of lava formation. You don't find this columnar stuff like uh, north of Greban and Morvern, parts of Northwest Mall. And the reason for that is because there was quite high ground there. You weren't, you weren't talking about valleys, you were talking about much higher land and there was nowhere for the lava to get ponded. So that's why you don't find those columns in places like that. Even though you're right at the base of the lava sequence. So post deposition, after all this has happened, one of the things that you'll notice, and it's, it's really quite noticeable in that picture, well, I've used as the background here of a staffer, is that there's a definite dip. It's not level. It looks like it's tipped over a bit. And Alva and Staffa both show that quite well. Now, this is a post depositional feature. This isn't caused by the lava running down a slope and solidifying, which is a possibility, but not in this case. What this is caused by is the central complex. Now, remember I said earlier, the lavas were the first thing to happen and the central complex came along later. And the central complex was pushed into the lavas and what's happened is it's distorted them. And we can see this elsewhere in Mull. In Southeast Mull, this is very pronounced. This is, a, this is from Emily and Belt and it shows you the anticlines and synclines in the lavas, the way the lavas are folded in Southeast Mull. And that's why the, that's because of the central complex, all the stuff that was pushed up in the middle caused the lavas to contort and fold. And if you look at this picture of Staffa, you can see there's a definite tilt on it there. And again, that's because of the central complex causing the thing to be gently pushed up, the doming upwards, causing it to tilt. The same with Ulva. When you come over from Salin, around about places like Acheronich, looking over to Ulva, the dip is really, really obvious. And there was no way you'd get that sort of dipping with a, a very fluid lava. You know, it would, it would form horizontal flows. Um, so that must be a post-depositional effect caused by the central intrusions. So it's been, that's, it's been affected. Generally, it's not severe in the case of this. In Southeast Mull, the, the folding of the rocks is a bit more severe, but in Staff and Ulva, it's, it's not nearly so pronounced, but it's still obvious, you can still see it. So I've got some pretty pictures of Staffa lava formation to show you, and we'll be sort of uh, sort of finishing off with this. We'll talk about these pictures and we'll go through. This is Ulva. This is the south coast of Ulva, uh, showing the columns. And uh, it's been said on more than one occasion that the a, if you can't get out to Staffa because of the weather or whatever, then take a trip over to Ulva and look at the columns there, because they're really nice. They're, you know, they're very they're very. It's, it's, it's probably the the best columns that you'll see apart from Staffa, I would, I would say. Um, that's, uh, that was taken a couple of years ago. That's a person, that's Jess Pugsley, who's doing a PhD at Aberdeen University. Uh, she was with me on this day looking at rocks and just gives you a sense of the scale of the things. There's, um, you, you'll notice the vertical cracks, the vertical columns. You'll also see that there's horizontal lines and it can, they can look like it looks like big piles of hexagonal nuts. If you take, you know, engineering nuts and pile them up, you know, the hexagonal ones, it would look sort of like that. And what these are, they're, they're called chisel joints, and these are just contraction cracks that form across the way. So as well as the vertical cracks that form the main column, the main pillars, the main columns, you've also got cracks uh, happening across the way. And, as, and you know, as the thing cools, it's like so many things, as it cools, it contracts. It takes up a smaller volume, and that's why you get that happening. So that's that's Ulva. On Ulva Ferry side of the the water, you've got these big columns there. Now the interesting thing is that the Ulva Ferry columns, you don't actually see these on the Ulva side directly opposite. So I think there must be a fault or something running through the sound of Ulva that's caused a bit of displacement. But these, I mean, these are big wide coming I mean, they're not particularly tall but they're really wide and um you know you, you don't see this on the, the Ulva side well i haven't found it anyway that's what they look like they're, it's very very hard rock as well it's a very very solid lava this um 
And that's, that's, that's just, oh, that's just south of the slipway. It's really, it's really easy to get to. If you go a little bit further around the coast, you come to this place called Ars Jerich, Red Point, Red Height. And um, there's some really nice columns here as well. So that's Ars Jerich, this place here. That's the island of the Orsa out there. And that's Ben Moore up there with the snow on it. So it's a, it's a really nice place. There's, it's, a good, it's a popular climbing ground as well. There's not actually that many places in Mull that are really suitable for climbing because most of the basalt is pretty chossy and you, know, you can take your life and your hands going up it. But uh, this stuff at Ars Jerich is, uh, is, has been well climbed. As a, as a local climber done quite a lot there, put a few routes up on it. Here's a picture of it from underneath. And you're actually looking up into the columns, into the underside of the columns. And you can, you can see there's quite a lot of stuff come down there. You know, these, these, these spaces here where stuff's broken off. But for, for the most part, it's quite solid. So that's Argeric near Olva Fed. And that's just basically a continuation of the stuff in Olva. It's the same, it looks pretty much like the same formation to me. I'm pretty sure it's the same. This is what it looks like from the south side of Loch Nakiel. You've got this gently dipping a uh, rock and it's obviously really columnar. You can see the columns right from the other side of the water. It's quite a wild day that was taken on, but it was, it was reasonably clear. Um, so that, that's what's going on there. And the, the, the rocks in the background, this is all made up from what are called the plateau lavas. That's, some, that's the later ones. This little thing here is interesting. That's, uh, that's a volcanic plug called Dun Moor. And that is reckoned to be one of the sources for a lot of the lava. It's like a conduit. What you're seeing is the, the stump, um, something's called volcanic necks in some places. Uh, there's quite a few of them in uh, Fife and Lothian, as Angus will tell you, because uh, he, he studied them well. But uh, that's what that is. And it's, it's, the, it's the stump, it's the, con it's the solidified rock and a conduit that lava would have come up. So there's, there's quite a few of these in North Mull. Here's Staffa, of course, we've seen it before. That's, uh, that's the sort of classic view of it. And you can see the, the, the tilt, the dip on the lavas quite clearly there. Here's Fingal's Cave, that's the, the boat cave, that one's called. And that's McKinnon's Cave around here. Um, this stuff here, this pale colored material is the ash that underlies the, the lava. So you've got the, the main bit, the colonnade as it's called, and you've got the entablature of the stuff on top. Now, the reason that this lot is nice and, and well, would have been vertical until it got tilted is because this was deposited in a, water wetery, a wet watery environment around the columns to flow up. The effects of the lava would have been to have ponded in, uh, lava would have ponded in, the, in some sort of valley. And what's happened is water has flowed across the top of the lava as it was solidifying. And that water flowing across the top has resulted in distorted columns. And you get this in other places as well. It's quite a common feature this to have nice, neat vertical columns and then distorted columns on top. Now, that, 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 the, the, like I said earlier, the water is essential for the formation of the columns whether it's forming nice, neat vertical ones or distorted ones because it's been flowing across it. Here's another picture of Staffa, again, showing you the, you know, the stuff on top is actually a, a greater thickness than the, the regular columns underneath. This is taken from the boat, obviously looking across, and Fingal's Cave is just in here. So one of the things about Fingal's Cave is that there's, a, there's, an, obvious, there's an obvious notch in the roof of it and I, I've often wondered, is there a, is there a, it's hard to tell, you, don't really, you can't really see it, but is there a, something like a fault running through there? Something that's produced a line of weakness that the sea has exploited to actually make the cave? Because it, it, you know, it's, it's, there's a definite crack of some sort running through there. So next time you're out there, have a look and you'll see what I mean. We move over to the fossil tree area near Ardmianach, where the McCulloch's famous tree is. And you've got this amazing feature on the shore. Now this here is rock, this is basaltic rock, the staff of lava formation, but it's jointed in a radial pattern around the central hole. And what is reckoned to have happened here is there's been a tree growing up there. It's long gone now, there's no trace of it. And what you're seeing is that the, the, the lava has cooled round about that tree 
and that's why you've got the the joints like that it's quite amazing i don't know of anything like this anywhere else it's uh it's quite, uh, it's really quite unusual. It's quite spectacular. It's like a big daisy on the shore. I've never been down to it. One of these things I've always been meant to take a trip down into the tide would have to be low. Um, but uh, it's mentioned in MLS and uh, in what do you call it, Williamson and Bell's paper on the Staff of Lava Formation. They've actually got uh, a picture of people standing beside this thing. It's, it's actually huge. So it must have been quite a big tree. But that's what that is. This is me standing beside some columns not far from the famous fossil tree and you can see they can see the, 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 this are nut like well i'm not standing there they can see the nut like um cracks in the rocks there uh, and here's some more of it and you can see this is just this is not far it's just around the corner uh, from the fossil tree you see this you know there's a lot of this stuff that breaks up readily there's an awful lot of loose blocks lying on the shore and they're not you know that that's not been lying there for a long long time that's fairly recent up above you can see the plateau lavas that form these regular, fairly thin flows. So this is Staffa lava formation. This is the plateau lavas up above, and the um, that, that's what that Armenian Peninsula is mainly composed of. This is a film crew. I was doing a program for uh, Gallic TV talking about the fossil tree, and they're actually filming. That's the fossil tree. That's the the remaining bit of the fossil tree there, and this thing here is the cast of it where. And this goes away up the cliff. So it must have been quite a big tree in its time. And it was just overwhelmed by lava, but relatively preserved. Because again, I mean, if you look at this thing, they poured cement over it to try and preserve it, I think to stop people from stealing bits of it. But if you explore this, you can see black charcoal. That's what quite, it's quite remarkable to think, you know, you can put your finger on wood that's 60 million years old and burnt, but still there. It's a remarkable thing. It's, it's called McCulloch's tree. It's named after John McCulloch, who first noted it, or well, I first recorded it, I, I dare say that the indigenous people of Mull may have noticed it and thought about it long before John McCulloch got there. Um, but the, uh, he was the, he, 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 you know, first really noted it and brought it to attention. And um, it's, 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 not, you know, it's in a pretty inaccessible place, to be honest. You know, it's, it's a fair effort to get to the fossil tree. Um, it's, it's well worth doing, but it's just such an unusual uh, thing. Of course, if you go and have a plug for Angus's trips here, if you go on one of Angus's trips, he'll uh, get Mark Jordan's boat and you can go out from Iona and actually sail out to the fossil tree. That's a really relaxed, sensible way to do it rather than traipsing across the road that the state road goes on for miles. So there are other ways of getting to it. Well worth a visit. Everybody should go to the fossil tree at least once in their lifetime. Round about the fossil tree, you've got this ash with lumps of volcanic basalt, you know, rock in amongst it. This is this is this is lies at the base again. This is low down, uh, below that you've got the columns here. This is actually looking down over the edge, onto the, the underlying ash deposit. So it's quite it's similar to the stuff you get in Staffa, and again in Staffa you've got these lumps of basalt which are you know what's called volcanic bombs that have been thrown out, ejected, and landed in the ash. That's what's going on here? This is our tun. Our tun is on the other side of Loch Screda, and you've got these beautiful columns on their side. Now you think, well, why are the columns on their side? Why are they not vertical? Uh, the columns form at right angles to the cooling surface. So if the lava was in some sort of gully or valley or whatever, if it was cooling against the sides, then the columns will come outwards. And that's what's going on there. It's my hammer for scale, gives you an idea of the size of these things. There's a great sea stack at our tun. It's like a huge fist coming out of the sea. Fantastic looking thing. Um, again, it's columnar. The, the coastal scenery around here is just amazing. It really is. And there's a cave, a deep cave with more columns in front of it. Can't get enough of this stuff. It's great. You know, it's like well worth a visit. And our tun is where the famous leaf bed uh, is, or maybe was, because anytime I've been there looking for it, it's under, there's fossil leaves to be found. It was the Duke of Argyle who first really noted it. Um, I have never been able to find any leaves. I suspect if you were to go down into the bottom of the gully here, where a lot, there's a lot of fallen boulders, you might find have better luck actually trying to find them. But um, it shows that, you know, there was a time in between extrusions of lava when it would have been quiet, where there would have been erosion of the surface, where there would have been water building up where plants would have grown it would have been colonized by plants uh, and trees so 
Um, you know, it, it wasn't just volcanic all the time. There were periods in between when there was uh, growth taking place. And as, and as you know, as we know, you know, volcanic soil was quite fertile, so it would you know have been colonised quite quickly. This is the famous Karsig arches. Yeah, and I mean, you don't get more classic um, staff or lava formation than this. This is this is a fantastic area. Again, quite remote. That's the trouble with a lot of this stuff. It's quite difficult to get to places. You've got to be reasonably fit, really, to properly appreciate the staff or lava formation. But um, yeah, this is the Karsig arches from the west. One of them is basically a cave. The other one is a, a sea stack. And you can see that the columnar rock. This is the, the cliff above the arches. This, there's a huge thickness. I mean, it's a staff of lava formation nearly all the, all the way to the top of this. And um, so it's, it's the biggest thickness of it is here in this part of Mull. That's some more columns near the arches. It's just like the same sort of thing. This is to the east of Karsig. Uh, if you go to the Karsig Pier and you head off to the east, you find these beautiful sort of organ pipe-like columns in the cliff. And you can look up and underside of them, just like, just like those ones I showed you earlier at our Jerich. You actually stand up and look into them. There's a beautiful little sea stack just near there, not far from this point. This is where this is where the path curves round to go towards Loch Buoy. That's the Lagan Peninsula there. Um, this sea stack has got a cave in it, and the cave's got a window. That's what that thing is in the middle. So it's it's quite an interesting, and it's columnar. You see, you see the columnar rock there. So it's just a bit that's been resisted erosion a bit more than the rest, so it stands out as a stack. And it's quite an interesting feature. And it's got a wee bench in it as well, so you can sit down, good place for lunch. I mentioned uh, that there's columnar stuff in the top in the top part of Mall, up in near Tobermory, there's a place called Glachvor, near Bloody Bay. And there's this very distinctive columnar formation there. Um, somebody said it looks like a mini giant's causeway, which maybe, you know, exaggerating a bit, but it's certainly worth a look. It's the, the columns are very distinct. You'll also see quite distinct columns near the lighthouse at Ruan and Gal, which is a popular walk from Tobermory. And so anybody in the Tobermory, if you want to see nice columnar rock, uh, go to the lighthouse and you'll find it there as well. It's, it's similar to this. And I want to mention one final location where you'll find columnar rock, uh, but it's not staff or lava formation. It's the little island of Stachvik Vuriki, which is west of Iona, and it's columnar, but it's probably a sill and not a lava flow. Now you think, well, what's a sill? What's a lava? What's the difference? Well, a sill is molten material that has solidified below the surface, usually sort of horizontal. It's, it's been intruded in between the layers, whereas a lava flow has poured out of the surface. Now they can actually look quite similar. Um, but I think that Stachvik Vuriki as a sill uh, it has a lot of the characteristics of other sills in the area. The trouble is, because it's a little island away in the ocean, you don't actually see the top and the bottom of it. So it's hard to tell if it's, if it's you can, to say absolutely definitely it's not a lava flow, but it just, it looks like a lava, it looks like a sill to me. Where is it? Well, there's Iona and there's Stachvik Vuriki there. Ian Morrison, who does the, the, the boat trips out to Staffa, jokes that if you can pronounce Stach Vich Vuriki, he'll give you a discount. So that's someone to practice on. You practice your Gaelic, start with that. If you can say Stach Vich Vuriki, you can say most things. Um, yeah, it's just west of Iona. And this is what it looks like. Nice columns. Beautiful columns, in fact. Incredibly hard. Uh, which, which again makes me think that it's a sill. There's some of the local residents. Either shags or cormorants, not sure which one, but sitting on top of the columns. It's uh, it's, it's quite neat. It's you know it's, it's it's difficult to actually get to and land on. We had a fair effort to actually get onto this thing uh, a few years ago, but it was, it was well worth a visit. And that's what it looks like in thin section. Now thin sections are what geologists love looking at. Take a piece of rock, cut it into a thin slice, and then you grind it down to it's thirty microns thick. When it's that thick or that thin, rather, you can look at it under the microscope and you can see what it looks like. Uh, the different colours that appear under cross-polarised light tell you something about the, the what it's composed of. These bright coloured bits that you see is the mineral olivine, and there's a lot in there. So it's an olivine dolerite, 
and that makes it more likely to be the sort of thing you would find in a sill rather than a lava flow. You do get all of in lava flows, but uh, this is very, very similar to other sills in Mull. So that's what the rock looks like. It looks like it's grey in hand specimen. Uh, it's hard when you cut it up and do that to it. That's what it looks like under the microscope. So quite interesting, fascinating place. Um, it's like I said, it's difficult to get to. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major effort trying to land on it. But um, no, that's, that's that. But that's not, although it's columnar, it's not the same as the staff of lava formation. Well, I don't think so, anyway. And that's all. So I'll finish there. <clears throat>